Good afternoon and welcome to the overview of Food Preservation 101. Um, I'm Denise Smith. I'm the University Extension Educator for Nutrition and Food Safety located in Niagara County, which is in Lusk. And with me today is my assistant, Aaron Smith, who um, also works here at the Niagara County Extension Office. So, um, we're thrilled to be bringing you just a little bit about food preservation today to maybe pique your interest if you have never preserved food before, or if you're a seasoned food preserver, maybe give you some updates and kind of get you thinking about food preservation season. With the COVID-19 virus hitting, um, I have received numerous food preservation calls already this year. Normally we don't start seeing those calls till later in the summer when the produce um, starts getting ripe and people are picking things out of their garden. But this year people are kind of in the um, mood or to get some foods put away for maybe a rainy day. So hopefully this will help you as you start to pursue, pursue food preservation. A um, little background about me. I started my interest in canning and food preserving when I was growing up. Um, back in the 1960s, um, I helped my grandma and my mom can. Um, my grandma always had a huge garden, and she put up everything. Um, canned, did all of that, and so I learned kind of from her of things to do. Of course, recommendations have changed a lot since the 1960s, and so I had to um, new, learn all new things as I went to college, and as I got my job as the extension educator. Um, my mom canned a lot also, and I helped her. My mom didn't have much of a garden, so what we did have out of the garden, we usually ate. We would buy bushels of peaches and pears in the fall and put those up in, in a method called open kettle canning. Um, that is definitely not uh, a process that is approved anymore. So again, I had to learn all new ways to do things. And um, it's been an interesting, interesting journey since then of learning and practicing and teaching food preservation classes. Now, um, my daughter and I do our food preservation together. It's a lot more fun to do it with a partner and it's a lot less work. So I think I have one of my daughter-in-laws convinced that um, she wants to learn a little food preservation. So this fall, our plan is to do some salsa and pickled beets, which are her two favorites. So it can be a family affair, a neighborhood affair, and the more the merrier. You just need to remember to do everything safely. So our first segment today is just going to be on some general guidelines of food preservation. And um, so we're going to start here and then we're going to break it up into different sections and do a little brief educational section on the different aspects of food preservation, including um, dehydrating, water bath canning, pressure canning, and freezing. So, get ready to just sit back and relax and, and hopefully we can teach you something new today. So with that, we're going to move over here a little bit and I'm going to get a drink of water. Probably the most important thing I feel that you can do when you're starting to be a canner or some a food preserver 
or whether you've been one for a long time, is to make sure that you are using um, resources that are tested, approved, and um, deemed safe for you to use. Um, the USDA went through a huge food preservation um, testing update in 1994, and at that point, um, basically all the recommendations changed. Since 1994, they have had updates to those recommendations. So my best advice to you is if you have a ball canning book or another book from previous to 1994 that you are using, um, you don't need to throw it away. Put it in your archive section or your historical section, but don't use those resources anymore. Use up-to-date um, resources, and I will show you the ones that are approved um, through the University of Wyoming, through USDA, and um, those are the ones we recommend that you use. So the first one um, that is just your basic um, canning guide is the Ball Blue Book. And this is the most recent edition. They usually come out with one of these um, every two years. And this gives you not only the basics of how to water bath can, how to dry, how to freeze, but it gives you a lot of the recipes that um, most of us would be working with. So this is a must to have. The other book that is um, kind of the Bible of food preservation is the Complete Guide to Home Canning, and this is put out by the USDA. Most of these you can go on to sites like Amazon and order them. I know Walmart and maybe your local um, hardware stores, Murdoch's, stores like that, usually stock the Ball Blue Book, so those are pretty local. The other books that are that you can use are these two are put out by Ball. This is um, Complete Book of Home Preserving. This is probably my favorite book ever. It has all the fun recipes in it. Um, the Ball Blue Book has more basic recipes. This one has fun things like jalapeno jelly and chocolate raspberry sundae sauce and those kind of things that I like to preserve. This is the newest ball canning book, and it's the all-new ball book of canning and preserving. And again, some very different recipes um, that you may want to try once you get your feet wet. The other book that's really a good book is called So Easy to Preserve. And this is put out by the University of Georgia Extension. And they also have a video that goes with the book. So um, it's a great way to watch the video, read the book, and practice at home. So um, these are available on the So Easy to Preserve site. The other things that um, I have here in my office is I have notebooks of resources. So if you would call me with a canning question, if I don't know the answer, and no matter who calls about a preserving question, I always get my books out because every recipe is specific. And um, I don't want to answer without making sure I've looked up the correct answer and given you the complete information. So we do, I do have those books available. The other thing that the University of Wyoming has put out is a series of 12 newsletters called Canner's Corner. And if you are interested in receiving these newsletters, um, just give me a call, send me an email, we can get those in the mail to you. And the other resources, resource that we have is called Preserving Food in Wyoming. And this has a complete section on 
doing wild fruits and berries that we have here, plus all the general canning recommendations. These are available in every extension office across Wyoming, so uh, free of charge. So you can stop by your local extension office and get one of those. Some of the other upcoming things that um, are available is there is a web-based canning class that we do twice a year, once in June, once in January. This is a cooperative effort between um, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, and Colorado. The June um, information will be coming out just shortly. The cost of that class is $35 and it's for like eight weeks. So you do it all online and it's a great resource to be able to do because we're not being able to do a lot of, um, at this point, person to person things. But there's only um, two and a half extension educators left in Wyoming and we just can't cover the 23 counties and the reservation. So these online um, options are going to become even more important as we move forward. The other is the National Center for Home Preservation, and they also have a online um, canning class. It is free and not quite as in depth as the um, Preserve at Home one, but it is available on their website. So we also have some flyers from um, Presto that puts out the canners. So these are also available if you're interested. The most important thing is to remember to use these resources. Do not use recipes that appear on Pinterest, on um, Facebook, those kind of things. Usually 99.9% .9 of the time those are not approved recipes, and you risk um, them failing, plus the biggest risk is your health. So, all right, we're going to move back over here and kind of go over some of the equipment that you're going to need to um, do whatever method of food preservation that you're going to do. So we start out with really basic things like you need a good cutting board, good sharp knives, and um, so I brought our color-coded cutting board. Green is for fruits and vegetables, so um, you don't have to have a colored one, but a good cutting board and make sure that all of your equipment is clean when you start and that you've washed your hands very, very well. Other things that you are going to need as you begin your um, canning recipes or your freezing recipes are a set of liquid measuring cups, um, dry measuring cups, and a set of good measuring spoons. Always have your pot holders ready because every, most everything you're going to be doing is hot. So I have a good supply of pot holders. You can also buy a canning kit, and um, that's a good thing for a starter, that comes with all of these little tools in it. Your funnel for filling your jars. This is your jar lifter. It will hook onto your jar as you lower it into your water bath canner or your pressure canner and bring them out without you having to ever touch the hot glass. The other thing that um, comes in your kit, this is a bubble freer. So after your food is in, you would use this end to go around and make sure that there's no bubbles in there. And on this end, it's your head space measure. Each recipe will have a specific headspace that needs to be in that jar. And so this little tool is a great tool. 
You can also use a plastic um, scraper spatula to free the bubbles. Never use a metal knife. Always have something plastic because you stick a knife in this hot jar with hot food, you're liable to break the side of the jar out. This is a lid lifter. It has a little magnet on the end. And the flaps are metal, so you can pick them up and put them appropriately on the jar and never have to touch them with your hands. Other tools that come in the kit are a pair of tongs in case you need to move something that's hot. And this is a tool that I really do not like to use. This is your jar ring tightener. And we have found that you want to put your rings on your jar just finger tight. If you use this little tool, you can crank them on so tight, you'll probably never get them off again. So this goes in the bottom of my kit, and I never, ever use it. So the other handy thing that um, you might want to use is a vegetable brush as you're starting to um, do your pressure canning. Um, this can get down in the crevices of all the veggies and help remove that dirt. Um, you don't want to use that with your fruit. Usually your fruit is very thin skinned and um, it could really bruise your fruit. The last thing you're going to need is a good marker to um, mark whatever you have preserved. You want to mark it with what it is, whether it's diced peaches, um, carrots, whatever, and the date that you preserved them. And you always think, oh, I'm going to remember what that is. And trust me, you don't. And then pretty soon you have a whole pantry full of food or a whole freezer full of food that you have no idea what it is and how long it's been there. So I like to, on my canned goods, just use the flat, right on the flat, because these are one-time use lids, this part. So once you use that jar of food, you can throw it away and start over the next year with a new, new lid. But please remember, and as you're freezing, we'll talk about that, or your jams or jellies, and be sure to label them. What I brought today is an assortment of jars. And over on this side of the table is our, our approved jars. And there is a difference between jars that you can use for canning and jars you should never use for canning. So over here are my jars to never use. That would include a mayonnaise jar. And these are harder to come by anymore because most of the mayonnaise comes in plastic jars. But you can go to garage sales, yard sales, estate sales, and they'll be selling boxes of candy jars. And in them might be some of these. Other things like spaghetti sauce jars, or um, this was a jelly jar, a commercially prepared jelly jar. But it is not um, for home canning. And this is the old jelly jars that you used to put paraffin on to seal, that don't even have a way to attach a lid. So if you have any of those, these make great drinking glasses. These you can use for crafts or storing food in your refrigerator, but not for canning. So to get a canning jar, if you buy them at the store, they will come in flats of a dozen at a time. They will come either in quart size, which is four cups, pint size, two cups. And this is a squatty pint, but it's still two cups. Then we have um, the eight ounce jars that are more like for jelly. And these are 12 ounce jars and another 12 ounce jars. And we get them clear down to four ounces for like jellies. Um, make sure that they say 
You know, most of them are made by ball or curve. There's some autumn harvest. Um, you can definitely, they'll say home canning jars on them. Make sure you purchase those. If you get new ones, they come with um, lids and flaps, but then you can buy separate boxes of lids and flaps. This part is called the ring, and these are reusable as long as they are not rusted, dented, um, or damaged in any way. These are, again, one-time use only. So I did bring why you do not use these jars. These oftentimes crack in your canner or the whole bottom falls out. So, and this I'm showing you is an actual canning jar that had probably a little fault in it or it got bumped and it cracked the whole bottom out and it'll just come out just like this and then your canner is full of whatever food was in there and glass shards and it is a terrible mess. So that's why we encourage everyone to use these. If you do purchase jars at a garage sale, estate sale, whatever, do realize that canning jars do have a lifespan. If they're really, really old and have been used well over those years, um, they could end up like this. So just be really careful about um, jars that you get other than brand new. They say the lifespan of a canning jar is about 10 years. So that kind of gives you a guidance of when you need to start recycling your jars for other purposes. So with that, we're going to take a quick break and um, kind of rearrange our tables. Oh, the one thing I forgot to tell you is if you do have a kitchen scale, you might want to have that handy because sometimes it says one pound of jalapenos or 18 jalapenos and then you have to go to a conversion chart to figure out how much that would weigh, how many cups that would be. So a kitchen scale can be very helpful. Not necessary, but helpful. So with that, we'll close on session one and we'll get ready for session two.